How's it going everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we're looking at Satan Slaves 2 Communion. We pick up a few years after the events of the first film and follow our family as they encounter a whole new mess of satanic shenanigans. And the story gets even bigger, leaving us with even more questions. In this video, we'll be breaking down everything you need to know. So let's check out Satan Slaves Communion, investigating the increasingly complex story, including what the cult is up to this time, and explaining the ending. Our story begins a few decades prior to to the events of the first film back on April 18th, 1955 with a younger Budiman. He's being escorted somewhere by a bunch of officers and he keeps pressing them to say something, threatening that kidnapping a journalist is a crime, but they stay silent. He looks out the window, noticing waves of gravestones. They pull up to what looks like an observation building and a suited man, Haru, is looking troubled. Budiman actually knows him and was trying to use their friendship to his advantage and didn't realize it was actually him that called him out here. Hiru gravely tells him to look inside and Budiman enters the room, gasping in astonishment. There's a whole gaggle of people's bodies bound up in the same position and aligned under the telescope. Flies buzz around the rotting corpses as Budiman snaps photos of the bizarre and disturbing display. Hiru is quite concerned as the order has already come in to cover this incident up completely and put the bodies back like nothing happened at all. This is all due to the big Bang Dung conference occurring literally the next day. All kinds of world leaders are coming and this would be a bad look for the country. This confuses Budiman why even bring him out here? Well, that's due to another even more troubling detail. He points out a muddy spot on the ground, along with footprints approaching the building. Also including those little red seeds, as you remember, the cult leaves these behind for their ghouls to follow after to do their dirty work. Budiman can't believe what he's implying. Dead bodies don't just get up and walk around? Well, we already know better. But clearly this is his first encounter with that pesky satanic cult. Here his hands are tied, and he is worried that this means that something big, sinister, and and dangerous is coming. So he tasks his pal to write about the true story about what happened here, but suggests it's best to publish it in a way that sounds like a pulpy hoax, thus beginning Budiman's long journey of digging deeper into the cult and its evil practices. We float back through the observatory, passing over the bodies, and see that they are all in worship of a picture of Mwarni, or someone that sure looks like her. We then jump forward to 1984, picking up three years after the events of the first film. Rini has a job at a factory, and her boss encourages her to do something something more with her life. She offers a scholarship to a program for dropouts like her. Rini is uncertain, saying that she needs to take care of her brothers, but as the lady points out, they're all grown up now. It's time to embrace doing something for her own life for a change. Out in the bustling streets of Jakarta, there's word in the papers of mysterious snipers taking people out. Make sure to cover up your tattoos. This is actually based on a real series of killings that was occurring at the time in Indonesia. Without undergoing trial, many alleged criminals were killed by undercover Indonesian army death squads and secret police forces. This went on for a few years and it was eventually discovered that they were all carried out by the government in order to reduce crime rate. Not sure how well that worked. Rini arrives at their new home, an imposing brutal structure of an apartment building completely on its own in the middle of nowhere. Like there is nothing else around except that building. Rini waits along with the others glumly for the one elevator. The doors open and everyone shoves their way inside. It starts to go up and there's a sudden power surge causing it to breathe briefly blink off and struggles back on. Rini walks through the cold and vast corridors, spotting a kid that reminds her of Ian when he was taken. Wisnu signs to his mother and they are off to buy some rice. She signs to his mother asking how she's feeling and she says she's a little bit better at least. Bondi has definitely done some growing up since we last saw him with his hair more wild and moppish than ever. He and his two buds, Darto and Ari, are investigating the grounds near the Madeira building. He's unearthed what sure looks like a gravestone buried in the ground, convincing him that they're at one point was a graveyard here. They think that he just has too much imagination, bringing up his stories about being chased by zombies. Ari's dad stomps up, annoyed with his boy, and smacks him good. He sees that he's been working all day, and he's supposed to make dinner for himself. He says his sister is starving. Weena whispering back that she's not, and her dad tells her to cram it. Oh, jeez, lovely guy, huh? Darto assures him that if indeed his wild stories are true, there's nothing to worry about in the building. There's so many people around, all you have to do is yell, and they will come running to help. Yeah, we'll see about that. Tony rolls up, eyeing the new tenant, Tari, and clearly he's smitten. Some other guys, especially Dino, attempt to hit on her, suggesting they can go to his place. He grabs her arm and she twists it back painfully. Oh, you mean your room at your mommy's house, she sneers, and his boys laugh at the pathetic display. Tony doesn't let this deter him, and he quickly follows Tari onto the elevator. He awkwardly follows her to her floor and limply pretends to tie his shoes when she turns around. She presses him with some questions, Tony saying that he just wanted to know where she 
she lived. Not really helping your case there. She calls him a perv and he attempts to correct that he's a nice guy and lives in the building with his family. He begins to walk off defeated and she shouts after asking for help with her stuck door. He does get it open and tells him to come back to fix it later, slamming the door closed in his face. He starts to leave again and she has another request. Can you fix electronics too? Handing over radio. Tony is a little tense after his prior experience with haunted radios, but he's not about to let Tari down. He returns home with a giant smirk on his face and his siblings are baffled. What have you been up to? Bonnie assumes that he was getting to know that older lady on the ninth floor. Rumor has it that she's a call girl. He says he doesn't have a problem with them though. He's still trying to be a gigolo himself. Rini tells him that it's a gigolo's job to make someone happy, but not yourself. Are you sure you want that? Bondi wisely points out, isn't that how all jobs are? And she has to agree. Bari enters and the air is sucked right out of the room with his presence. He walks past the family without a word and puts up a mysterious briefcase in a locked cabinet. Hmm. We learned that they left their previous apartment due to nosy neighbors, Darmina and her hubby, and it seems that they have the same problem here too. Still discussing Tari, Bondi doesn't see the big deal as mom was way older than dad when they got married. Even the mention of her causes the table to go silent. As Bondi points out, the family seem unwilling to even discuss the strangest that occurred a few years back, and they are all confident that was in the past and it won't happen again. Although there are some worries about the building's location and design, it's far too close to the sea. If there's a big storm, the land would fill in, drowning everyone. Well, let's hope there's not a big storm in the next day. And they think that it was built by the government on the cheapest land they could find. No one else would build out here due to these obvious safety concerns. Rini has a plan though. As soon as she gets her diploma and a better job, she can move the family on to better digs. She has decided after all to take her boss's offer and is starting her program literally the next day. Well, let's hope she makes it. The boys complain of leaving them a day before a big storm and she defends that she spent her whole life taking care of the family and this is her opportunity to grow. Bari finally pipes up, blankly telling her to go and the rest will stay here. And you're already like, man, something was really up with this guy. He wasn't ever the warmest dude around really, but now he is acting super dodgy. Reedy encounters the first oddness in the building when taking out the trash. The chute on her floor is jammed closed, sending her down to the seventh. She passes through the hall and all the tenants have the doors open. In one, a dude is curiously facing the wall, causing Rini to quicken her step. She dumps the trash and when she looks back, all the people are out in the hall staring right at her. She gasps and carefully makes her way back down. The first room appears empty, but the other tenants are all back to normal as though nothing happened. Maybe that is normal, just leave your door open. I don't know about that. Not in America, you keep that door locked tight. There's word on the news of the snipers learning 2,000 people have been killed since 81. All the victims are men with tattoos and are alleged criminals. Tony thinks that it is the army and police responsible in order to lower the crime rates, which is a true story. Bonnie jokes how he can't get a tattoo that he wanted now. What kind do you have in mind? A teddy bear? Tony laughs they probably won't shoot someone with a teddy bear tattoo. No worries there, bro. Rini enters looking shaken up, blaming it on Bonnie's imagination, making her paranoid. She doesn't elaborate on what happens, but wants to sleep out in the main room. Soon, Bari joins him, complaining that he can't sleep either, and everyone hunkers down in the living room. Wisnu is out tending with his trash and encounters the stuck door just like Reedy did. However, as he starts to walk away, the door teasingly creaks open. He tosses down the bag, staring into the darkness, and see that the trash got stuck in the chute. He tries to poke it loose, leaning way over the side into the shaft. A voice croaks his name. Open the door, it commands. Wisnu is about to lose his balance. It's hot in here, Wisnu. Snoo, the voice growls. His feet dangle over the side and he manages to pull himself back in. The voice repeats, it's hot in here, Wisnu, and starts aggressively pounding on the door. A man with a burned up face appears, demanding once more to open up, and the boy runs for his life. Back in his flat, he shoves down a photo of a man with longer hair, most likely his dad. Presumably he died in a fire based on the burns. The radio makes mention of the impending storm. Most people in high risk areas have already been evacuated, but not our poor tenants. We float right through the building, getting a real feel for just how large and foreboding it really is, we fly past the broken elevator and head right into Rini's family's place. The whole family is asleep in the main room and passing over the TV, the broadcast ends for the day. Color bars take over, followed by white noise. Rwarni appears then briefly amongst the fuzz, giving an evil grin and she glitches away. It's almost like that floating shot was actually her POV entering the apartment. In town, Budiman gets some bad news from his old pal, who after all these years couldn't go on anymore. He says he's been absolutely tortured for the past few years in particular by his fight against the evil. Was it created at the same time as humanity? Well, in that case, is there any purpose in attempting to defeat it? Is evil something we just have to accept, just like humanity? He's left him all the evidence that he's hung on to over the past 30 years. Budiman digs through the box, finding a photo of people 
gathered at the observatory from the opening. On some other pages, there are ornate designs, including one of a seahorse. Another drawing depicts a group of people in dark robes using horses to brutally quarter a victim. There's also some kind of ornate looking ceremonial stick, what's known as a pair of anguish. Not quite sure what that's for yet. He finds pictures of several serious looking dudes, and surprisingly, Bari is amongst them. Him remembering that he was the one driving back in 55. There's also a series of photos of buildings, including the very building where Rini and her family currently live. All this indicates that the cult actually constructed the building and that Bari is definitely involved in some capacity. In the morning, Rini is all packed up and ready to start her new collegiate adventure. She comes across some old photo albums depicting the family over the years, also including their mother in healthier times. It starts as just another typical day at the apartment with kids playing hopscotch and a crowd waiting impatiently for the elevator. A lady drops a hanky full of change, some of it rolling through a crack underneath. In Ari's house, we overhear his dad complaining about taking care of his ailing wife. Ari stands up for her, receiving another smackdown from his dad. His buddies are just outside and join Ari to flee from his papa's wrath. He quickly chases after, cutting in line for the elevator. Bari tells his boy to find a proper taxi for his sister. He steps onto the elevator and Tari and Tony step off, followed by Dino. He confronts Tony and Tari fibs that he's her brother. The lift starts ascending to the top floor and Wistu assures his mother that it's gotta go up first to drop people off for otherwise it'll be too full. It reaches the top floor and the power goes nutty again. Down on the bottom floor, a group of girls, including Ari's sister Weena, notice all those shiny coins that were dropped, furiously rushing to collect them. They get the lift doors pried open and it starts to fall. Things turning into a real life tower of terror over here. It slides down and Wisnu goes to climb out between the floors and is able to squeeze through. He reaches back for his mom and all the others hold her back. The passengers are whipped into a frenzy, scratching and clawing at each other to get out. It slides down once more and then drops into a complete free fall. Weena can see the elevator coming right for them and runs out shouting for the others to get a move on. They don't listen and the elevator crashes to the bottom, unleashing a deluge of blood upon the girl. Well, that was certainly unexpected. It appears that all the passengers died in the crash, seeing Ari's family getting his dad wrapped in burial sheets. Well, not too big of a loss there where that guy, guy was a total douche. The siblings discuss the tragedy with mixed feelings as they were all almost on that deadly ride. Tony believes that he should feel grateful, but it feels just wrong after all the deaths. Guess who somehow miraculously survived the accident with minor injuries? Well, Bari, of course, this dude is incredibly lucky, unless something else is going on here. Even the police question how he survived, and he admits that he doesn't know himself. All he remembers is passing out. We pass through the floors, hearing people throughout praying and singing hymns for their lost loved ones. In the city, the big storm has already hit, and Budman is desperate to get a ride to the apartments. A bus driver tells him, no way, it's gonna be flooded there. He attempts with a taxi too, and the guy isn't willing to take the risk, even if it is, as he says, a matter of life and death. It is for him too, if he dies, his family is screwed, bud. Out of nowhere, there's suddenly another dude at the bus stop whom we recognize as Batara. He and his wife, Darmina, are definitely involved in the cult, as we saw at the end of the first film. Budiman hasn't met him, however, yet he still has a lot of suspicious information regarding the apartments, somehow already knowing about the elevator incident. If that's what he was trying to prevent, it's too late, he smirks. It's something much worse, Budiman gravely replies, fingering some beads in his bag along with a gun. Tony returns the now-fixed radio to his crush, beaming that it is good as new. They do at least exchange names, but the only real thanks he gets is another slam door in the face. She gives it a test tune, the song with lyrics all about the evil of the night. It's no surprise to learn from the DJ that it's another one of Marani's joints, The Secret of My Vengeance, it's called. Huh, not exactly hiding those evil connections so much, Pretty on the nose there. There is a call in on the show, a man making a dedication to his family and the woman that broke his heart. He says he's not gonna let her go and will get her no matter what. Uh oh, that certainly sounds specifically aimed at Tari. Can't escape those damn haunted radios. Her voice comes on the radio, weakly crying to her mommy that it hurts. The maggots are eating her flesh and she can't move. She's all tied up. More insanity and screams take over the frequency. Someone then growls on to feel the pleasure and the radio cuts off. Tari peeks up seeing what looks like herself with her limbs painfully pretzel. She runs into the hall, bumping into Tony. The building is eerily quiet now, they notice, and Tony knows that some people have evacuated and assumes that the others must be all in their units. She doesn't mention what happened to her, but does ask him to dispose of the evil radio. With Wisnu and Rini, we learn that indeed his dad did perish in a house fire. The boy wasn't too bummed, saying that he was a bad man. He and his mother even devised their own secret language so he wouldn't understand. She's curious to learn more about it, and the language comes from a book that he randomly found 
found at a bookstore in a briefcase. He shows it off, sporting similar designs from Heru's evidence box. This, along with the briefcase thing, makes it clear that this book too is tied to the cult, containing their secret language. He has heard that she used to have her brother around his age. What happened to him? Was he kidnapped? Yeah, sure, close enough. Just a child of Satan and whatnot. Bari is watching the news, and the storm is going to be quite disastrous, just as Rini feared. There are incoming heavy floods, especially dangerous to those near sea level. Wow, well, that's that good. Bari's family continues mourning over his dad, and Bonnie drops by with some food. The lights all cut out, and a voice croaks, may you bow upon him who will soon be born. They thought it sounded like mom's voice, but it actually came from the door. They check out into the dark foreboding hall, seeing nothing. Rini heads home to fetch some candles, and noticing her dad passed out, decides to try and find out what's in his mysterious briefcase. She gets the cabinet unlocked, and Bari starts stirring awake. He enters, curious what she's doing, and she's already covered her tracks, excusing that she's just looking for candles. Tony stumbles across the Ustad, who enlists him to check on the victim's apartments. Minnie lived alone, and he just wants to make sure that the windows are closed and that kind of stuff. Tony can't help but get roped in, agreeing with a pained smile to lend a hand. Sounds good. Good. They check out the first flat and notice the window is wide open and slamming in the wind. Tony nervously passes by the bodies and seals it closed. When he looks back, the Ustad is gone, freaking him out, but he's just around the corner. Phew! They move on to another and everything seems okay in this unit. The Ustad is then overcome with back pain and asks the boy to check out another apartment on his own. They only have one flashlight and leaves the choice to him. You want the torch or the matches? He can sense that Tony is scared and tells him the only thing that he should fear is Allah. Well, yeah, that's true. But and his boys make it to the ground floor, finding it completely flooded. Well, that must have caused a blackout, they conclude, and there's no chance of swimming across the water either, as it is most likely electrified. They again notice just how eerily quiet it is around here, and decide to go knocking on doors in the hopes of finding anyone. They happen upon one that is unlocked, and they realize it is the neighborhood chief's place. Ari and his mom met him when they moved in last year. They find a locked back door, and considering that someone could be trapped, Bondi gets it open. They find the other room is the chief's office, leaving them wondering where he sleeps. Probably on the couch like you, shithead, Bondi cracks. They rifle through a filing cabinet, finding registration cards for everyone in the building. It lists his father's profession generically as freelance, and Bondi says he doesn't know any more than that. As they move on, we notice the same symbol from the evidence door box on a folder. They are then drawn to photos on the wall depicting the building being built and count up the floors. It should be only 14, but it appears to actually be 15. Ari calls him over with more pictures, seeing that there was indeed a graveyard here at some point. Pinpoint pointing that it's the same tree with the building now. Ari fiddles with a camera that he found, and in the flashes we definitely see someone standing there facing the wall. I would guess the chief. All I know for sure is it gave me the chili willies. I was like, is that really a guy there? They notice the same date of April 17th marked on the pictures, and whatever event depicted occurs every 29 years. Remember what date the opening was on? That's right, April 18th, obviously the day after something else happened. That means that something is happening tomorrow, some kind of gathering like in the picture. At the moment, the clock strikes midnight, it's officially the 17th, and we all know that's good enough for the evil. Ian was taken just after midnight on his birthday. Tony navigates the spooky 13th floor with only the aid of his little match to light the way. He finds their place, and the match goes out right when he opens the door. He spots the bodies on the ground, and their window is open too. He hurries over to close it, the breeze extinguishing the flame. He keeps lighting them over and over, and after one, the body's eyes are open and facing him. He goes in for a closer look, and once more, they briefly eye him creepily. Tony stumbles out into the dark, terrified, and bumps right into Dino. He asks him for a favor, and Tony is like, no more favors, please, dude. He helps out anyway, finding that a brick randomly fell out of his wall, allowing you to see right into his neighbor's place. For some reason, Dino dropped a fork in there, and wants Tony to climb in and get it. He's all for a fork, are you nuts? And Dino stresses that his mom will kick his butt. She's a stickler for silverware, apparently. Tony begrudgingly squeezes his way through the hole, tumbling over to the other side. He grabs a stupid fork, and when trying to climb back through, knocks a table over. He collects all the stuff back in place and stops at a photo album. He flips through, seeing gatherings of people, and then something really catches his eye. A drawing that looks just like his mom, but they are actually someone called Ramanam. The mysterious tenant even has a copy of her record, the mere sight of which freaks Tony out, quickly making his way back through the wall. They pour over the other photos, finding several of the building looking brand new, meaning whoever it is that lives there has been there a long time. Now word from this week's sponsor, Factor. Their delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better 
better every day easy. It couldn't be more convenient with their pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals, which are delivered right to your door. For me, I'm usually pretty busy, and sometimes it's hard to take the time to make a full-on dinner. That's why Factor is great. They've got everything ready to go, and it only takes two minutes to cook a restaurant-quality meal. I was genuinely impressed by the quality and flavor of the meals, plus the convenience of no prep or cleaning up. That's never fun. There's a ton of variety too, with over 35 different options a week to pick from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. It's perfect if you're looking for fast upscale meals done easily. As a special offer for viewers, head to factormeals.com slash ending50 and use code ending50 to get 50% off. That's code ending50 at factormeals.com slash ending50 to get 50% off. Tari is still on edge and her mother keeps appearing all around the apartment, first on the bed and then in a chair behind her. She runs out into the Ustad and she invites him inside for tea. She says that she's scared when alone and believes that something is haunting her. The Ustad lays out the supposed rules here. If it was a human, it's trickier and it would be dangerous to be alone. However, if the entity is not human, all you gotta do is totally surrender yourself to Allah. Tari was raised Muslim, but apparently hasn't practiced in a while. She does remember her Shalat prayer and he tasks her to do it. She's heard rumor that some people are still haunted while doing the prayer and he retorts that that's because they are doing it for the wrong reason. If you're afraid of the ghost rather than Allah as you should be, it's not going to work. She washes her face in the faucet in a moment reminiscent of Rini in the well room as she splashes water on her face. She suddenly teleported into a brick walled room overrun with cobwebs. She frantically splashes more water and is back in her place. This inspires her to give the prayer a try and begins to pray in earnest. She flips her garment up, sending her back to that weird place. It happens again and the flip doesn't work this time, seeing that she's surrounded by Pokong ghouls. She she flips and runs out of her apartment, crashing right into Tony and Dino. Meanwhile at Ari's, Weena hears clattering from the hall. She comes to a dark silhouette at the other end of the corridor, limping towards her. She fetches a lantern and gets closer, and two more appear from behind her, all three standing in odd, broken positions. They then slide up a tile or something, and a girl is there with a mangled face. Weena! A voice coos. She thinks that it's her mom and follows it right to the elevator. The doors open and beckon her inside. They close and she lights a match, the three girls appearing in there with her. She lights another. And we see she just floating on the shaft, wily Coyote style. Once noticing, she plummets to her demise, joining her crushed friends that Weena must have felt guilt over. Rini is back to wanting to find out what's in her dad's briefcase, and unable to get it open, just yoinks it along with her. They need somewhere to go, but no one feels that their place is safe, and definitely not Tari. So they settle on Dino's, as nothing strange has happened there yet. There they start piecing together the clues that they've gathered so far. Tony shows off the photos, and wouldn't you know it, it's the very same people from their mom's meetings. Even now, now he can't forget their faces. It appears to be at some kind of grand event with lots of foreigners in attendance. And Tari spills that something in this building was haunting her earlier. It's weird too as the floors are empty as though the tenants disappeared or perhaps they consider they're all gathered in one place. Then there's that drawing, Mother Rini says with a shudder. It's not her but Ramanam, which reminds Rini of those other photos of her mom earlier. She didn't start dressing in that white gown until after her Dark of Night album, meaning that she purposefully started dressing in the gown to resemble this other woman, Ramanam. Finally, there's their dad's mysterious briefcase, Rini even making mention of him leaving the day after their mom died, and he never did tell them where they went. Ah, see, I told you that was weird. They try to guess the combo, Dino suggesting 666. Little wise beyond his years, Wisnu offers that usually the most obvious choice is the most predictable, suggesting 000. And there you have it. The lock clicks open. They open it, immediately overpowered by a foul smell, seeing it's full of fingers. Dino is curious if they're real, and grabs one. Really screeches. Mm, not the smartest tool in the shed, this kid. After this revelation, the family ends up splitting up from Dino and Tari as they refuse to leave without their brother. They head to Ari's in search of their brother. At first, the place appears empty, but a strange jingling sound draws them back. They hurry back to see Weena walking into another room. They follow her and she disappears, everyone confirming that they saw that, right? There's sounds in the other room, and they find Ari's mother dead, hanging by a noose. Bondi and his boys keep scanning the halls and find another unlocked door. It does appear empty at first like the others, but Bondi notices it appears that someone is sitting in the chair. He cautiously spins it around and is absolutely flabbergasted to see his missing brother Ian. He falls to the floor in absolute shock. Rini and Tony run in after, and when seeing him too, appear just as disturbed and terrified by his appearance. It's nearly time for the unholy communion. Seeing all the corpses beginning to reanimate, including Ari's dad, Dino and Tari have made it to the still flooded downstairs. They're confused because it stopped raining, yet some 
somehow the water is still rising? They double check that there is no way of swimming across by tossing an extinguisher in and it is clearly electrified. The siblings debate what to do about Ian. If it's really him, he is Satan's offspring. But as Rini points out, if he is, then they are too. She feels they have to take him with us while he's still not so sure. We see Casley strolls right into the room and signs, what are you doing here? Ian doesn't respond and he retries in the cold secret language saying that he's a friend with a creepy smile. The siblings ask if he remembers them and he signs that he does. They inquire about that night and all that he says he remembers is going to sleep and he woke up here. Rini is convinced that they need to take the boy. What if he's an innocent victim in all this? Yeah. Do you know it's him climbing a pipe but there is no way across the water. Tari gets annoyed and stomps off him cursing her as a stupid woman. He swings back to the stairs and when rounding the corner the white lady is waiting for him. He tiptoes towards her and extends a hand. About to touch her she collapses into nothing but her dress left behind. He throws it towards the water and it straight up flies back ensnaring him. The lady is amongst the fabric and he yowls falling back and landing right onto a pitchfork that jams through his neck. It's a really big fork. Tari makes her way back up and a pokong shambles out. She tries running the other way to the white lady blocking her. She runs into the Ustad, who apparently is just walking around in the dark all night long. She describes seeing a shroud ghost, and he dismisses there is no such thing. Only jinns exist, and those can't be seen with human eyes. Oh yeah, well then what's that, smart guy? She asks, pointing out the obvious ghoul there. He curiously wanders after and walks upstairs, hearing nothing after he leaves sight. After calling for him and getting no response, she retraces his steps. She hears croaking from above, and the Ustad emerges with his head nearly completely removed from his body. She leaps into the trash chute, slamming the door closed. She tenses her toes and sees that it is quite a long fall down. Something starts messing with the door and she shuts off her light. The cursed radio turns on to a Marwani song and it is time for another listener to call in. They give a shout out to the one about to join us in hell. And Tari starts losing her traction. Why hell, the DJ asks, did she do something wrong? Nope, she did exactly everything right to get herself here, they say with devilish glee. The door above opens and a Pokong bursts a baby right from its mouth. The horrific sight causes her to lose her grip and she gets bent in half by the walls just as she saw back in her flat. Rini and the others happen upon their dad who says that he can explain everything. He alleges that everything he's done was to protect them and keep them safe. Rini disagrees everything about you is lies. He comes clean that this is all his fault. It was him that got her to make a deal with her. Her who? Why Ramanam of course. He keeps insisting that he's trying to save them and he grows incensed. Ian pops out from behind them shocking Bari. He goes from with his cane taking on the lantern. In the chaos, everyone gets separated, all running aimlessly through the flashes of lightning, and that voice repeats about, may you bow upon him who will soon be born. Amongst the blasts, we catch glimpses of Pokongs and suited up cult members positioned all over the place, still with their umbrellas inside. Better safe than sorry, I guess. Could be links around. Still running at full speed, Rini doesn't notice a cane right in front of her, and she crashes into it, knocking her unconscious. She comes to in an odd room with a camera flash blasting in her face. There's a group of cultists all chanting, and it looks like Ian is leading them like an evil little conductor, singing in that secret language. Father, he giggles, and then lists off the rest of the family one by one, and they all manifest in the room. Oh, and he doesn't want to forget his friends either, sending in his Pokong army. The lights go dark, and Ian hands over a leaf for Rini to eat. Forget everything and live happily, he offers. The flashing grows more intense, and he shoves it down her gullet. She wakes in a very different, much more luxurious environment, certainly some kind of fantasy caused by the leaf. She goes to class, and the teacher announces Rini as the big winner of a scholarship to the Netherlands. The whole class erupts into applause and Rini looks quite proud. Then she starts feeling off, her lips starting to twitch. Forget your family, the teacher chants. You can live happily here forever. She starts getting upset, crying and heaving to herself to wake up. She is able to break the spell, spitting up the leaf. Ian then shouts for his mother and his pretty horses and some kind of weird abstract people horse kind of thing show up along with Marani. We see Bari has ropes attached to his limbs and they start to pull. Him groaning, I love you all. Ian does a count to three and and Bari is brutally quartered, just like in that picture from the evidence box. This was definitely a surprise to have him die, but I guess after all the bad stuff he's been up to, kind of had it coming. Then it's Tony's turn to be tied up, begging his sister for help. She struggles to shake off the drug's effect and can't find her balance. Luckily, they are blessed with another Hail Mary save from Budiman with absolutely perfect timing. He shows up and opens fire, dropping the beads at the feet of the Pokongs. Hirwani turns on him and he activates the pair of anguish. Its front piece is opening up and the ghoul is launched into the air, trapping her up in the corner. Ian gets back to leading the crew, and Wisnu takes over in his place, pleading with him to stop. Rini baps Ian with a cane, shattering it on the way out. Seeing they were indeed on a secret 15th floor, and really enforcing that the cult itself most likely made the Madeira, as though it was designed for this specific purpose. Everyone gets loaded onto a small boat, and sets sail on the flooded waters. Rini is curious how Wisnu knew 
the zombies spoke the language from the book. And the boy casually mentions that her brother was mentioned in the book too. Whoa, 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 hold on there. That means that he somehow knew about Ian before he even met the family thanks to the book. That's weird, we'll get back to that. As they paddle further away from the building, it is a quite bizarre looking sight. Budiman has some more shocking information regarding their father. He was a police officer back in 55, and it was on duty that he first found out about Ramanam's cult. Must be that he worked on the case of the ritual from the opening. He asked their mother to join the group so that she could have children and be a star. I figured her career was part of the deal too, pretty classic. He only realized later that it was a mistake and attempted to terminate the deal, but it came with some serious strings attached. He was required to kill one thousand people. Holy shit, that's a lot. And of course, now we get that he was one of, if not the, Petra Sniper. This over time weighed heavily on Bari, and Budiman says he made a mistake, but truly did love them all dearly. Rini isn't buying it, saying through tears that he sacrificed her mother. He hints at a much bigger plot at play here. Her father was targeted from the get-go, while her mother was only camouflage. The cult, he says, have some kind of much larger and more sinister agenda brewing, and promises to tell them everything. Once more, leaving us with five million questions about what could come next, rebirth of Satan, something like that, that's my guess. We then return to the mid apartments where we learn of some surprising neighbors, Darmina and Batara, who live in that apartment right next to Dino's where all those photos were found. Now that all makes a bit more sense too. She wishes that they could have been here last night, and Batara reminds her that they had to let last night's events happen as they did in accordance with their plans. She's worried that people might know which side they're on, and they conclude that they are on their own side. They stick on Morani's record, and you just know they gotta cut a rug. Ooh, Ooh, they sure do love dancing. As they continue, we focus in on some photos, and one in particular. The couple is front and center at the Bangdong conference mentioned at the beginning back in 55, and the pair hasn't aged a day in 30 years. What are they, immortal or something? This at least implies that they must be pretty high up the Colts totem pole to get that kind of power at least. They've been doing this a long time, and who knows when they started. They could be the leaders as far as we know. But now at least we're really starting to grasp how big this organization really is, and it has been around for a long time. Literally everything that we've seen must be set up by the cult, and all this is according to some looming master plan coming into focus. Even just them moving to the Madeira in the first place. I mean, it had to have actually been built by the cult with a hidden communion floor and everything, and I can't help but think that Bari must have at least been aware of this and willingly put his family right where they were supposed to be, according to the cult. I mean, since he was at least kind of working for the group, that has to be it, right? Or I don't know, maybe not, since he does get torn to shreds by Ian and his buddies. Also interesting, as it initially appeared that Ian Ian intended on killing the entire family except for Rini. There's got to be a specific reasoning behind this that the cult wants her alive and trapped in that false dream world. That's just one of a billion different things that feels like they mean something, but at this point we don't know quite what exactly. It's honestly kind of nuts how many cliffhangers and lingering questions we have, really compounding on the complexity of the story presented in the first film. Things like Wisnu finding that cult secret sign language book that contained references to Ian, or just who who is the mysterious Ramanam? And they do refer to it as her cult. Or even Darto, what's up with his family? They don't even get a single mention that I recall in the whole movie. Just found that kind of odd. All of what we do learn really puts into perspective how big this cult really is. And they obviously have some massive years long plan that they have been putting together behind the scenes. We even see a photo from way back in the 1800s. So they must have been at least around since then, if not even longer. This makes me think of Haru's thoughts on his battle with the evil. It feels so big big to him that it is impossible to really ever defeat it. And it really feels like that's how it is with the cult too. It has already spread so much that there is no way to stop it at this point. As far as their plan specifically, it's hard to say exactly, but we can assume that the 55 communion and the incident at the Madeira were all stepping stones to their end game, following that same 29 year cycle each time, but for how long has this been going on we don't know. And to what end? There is that strange voice heard twice that references to bowing down to the newly born, and I really gotta think this has something to do with him resurrecting the devil. I mean, that just makes the most sense, right? We also now know that Ramanam is the group's de facto leader, and I wonder if she was ever a person at some point, and made her own deal with the devil to become this weird, evil, immortal entity thing, then this kicked off her starting the cult, getting others to join her and do their own deals with the devil, allowing her numbers to quickly rise to where we are now. Well, that wraps things up for now, and we will have to wait until Satan Slaves 3 to see what happens next. For now, why not check out this video over here? Thanks for watching. See you next time.